Hey, Jason. This is Greg here, guys, and I'm sitting here with Jason Harris, Strategy with Jason. If you don't know who he is, he is a prolific content creator. Uh, he puts out some amazing stuff. And uh, you, if you see him on LinkedIn, he's got 12,000 plus followers on LinkedIn. Most of his stuff is, all of his stuff is around the car business from working with dealer principals, sales, front end, back end, business office, uh, the service department. He serves all of it in a capacity. And the thing that's really unique with him, if you're watching this, you're like, oh, I'm not in the car business. His love for customer experience, and he might want to correct me, <laughs> I would say transcends the automobile industry. And, it's my uh, demand for the customer experience. No, no, yeah, no. I, yeah. I, I, de I demand an experience. Yes. And the cool, I've been really excited about this conversation because everyone, uh, if you're on my Facebook, you know, my love and hate with the car industry. And, uh, so you've probably seen some videos or you've heard my, my rants. Um, so I think this is going to be awesome. He has a lot to serve. And if you're looking for him after the show, you're going to look up strategy with Jason on pretty much any platform, uh, Twitter, Facebook, everything, and, uh, definitely LinkedIn. And you see it, he puts out, uh, how many pieces of content do you put out a day? Well, we put about 10 to 12 pieces of content per platform over four platforms. So we average between about 40 to 48 pieces of content a day. Yeah, that's that's an unbelievable <laughs> amount of work. An unbelievable amount of work. Impressive, um, but it makes you stand out. He's also dresses really well and his tie matches his headphones. I like, I honestly, I he does plan it. If you're wondering, he does. I, I it it matches my car too, by the way. Oh, what do you drive? That's a lot. I, I, I actually drive a Nissan Maxima that's wrapped in orange, which actually kind of sucks because it, there isn't any other orange Nissan Maximas in town. So I drive around, I literally drive an orange cone around. So I know it doesn't matter where I go, everybody knows I'm there. You know, it's like someone calls me up, hey, Jay, are you in the office or at the bar? I'm like, in the office? They're like, no, you're not. <laughs> they know exactly, exactly that you're not. And uh, so the Maximums are cool. I think they're a really underrated car as far as how yeah. comfortable they are and how fast they are. And they get up and go. And they do. And then they, you know, they last, they last forever. I mean, I, I've, I, I have a 2017 and in a little less than two years, I've put 178,000 kilometers on it. Nice. Wow. So I have literally, I'm a road warrior. I drive about uh, five to 8,000 kilometers a month. Uh, for the people in the US, uh, it's about three to 5,000 miles. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I, I, when I drove down to the US last year, I was really happy because I was trying to figure out my time and I realized that miles and hours go perfectly together. And I was like, yep. every time I look at it, I knew how far I had to go. I was like, man, why don't we have this in Canada? <laughs> it's <just> so <laughs> much easier. Um, but uh, my buddy, uh, well, Nutty, he'll probably not a, a named his nickname on this but, uh, his dad used to have a maxima and we used to take it it was like company vehicle and we used to take that nice. out when we were 16 years old we weren't supposed to with their <laughs> gas card and just rip around the valley and uh that was that car was probably my first experience probably doing over 200 kilometers an hour it was it was a fun car to be in yeah, I had a client. I had a client uh, call me last month. Obviously, not recently because we're all quarantined at home. But I had a client call me, and uh, I looked at my phone. I said, "Ooh, ooh, ooh! I've been waiting for this client to call me. Like this is going to be a good call." He calls me. He goes, uh, "Hey, this this jackass just cut me off on the highway doing about 150 um, in an orange Maxima. Well, where are you at right now?" And I'm like, "You know, Bob, there's no way that was me. I was easily doing a buck eighty. So I have no idea who the hell that was." <laughs> In an orange maximum. <laughs> the 401, you can go whatever speed you want. Like, it's just, it's ridiculous. I lived in Oakville, and I was traveling to Kitchener back in 2004, 2003. And every morning, I'd get on the highway and meet this Lexus. And he was doing, like, 240. Like, he was flying. And I did all I could in my Volkswagen Golf to keep up to him. And I just knew that he would get pulled over before I did. And, and I just, we drive there. We get there so fast. It's a good strategy. You live and yeah. die by your strategy, man. That's the way it is. <laughs> yeah. And, and anyways, it worked then, but probably wouldn't work very well now. But, but yeah, so how did you, you get started? I was reading, um, you started in the wash bay. Let's talk about that a little bit. You, you oh, yeah, dude. I got sucked into automotive. You know how it is. It's like, you know, so you need to make a little extra money. Um, you know, it was a summer job. Someone's like, come wash cars. I was like, okay, fine. So I went wash cars. And 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 that's and and I was done for the one season, then that was it, right? And then in university, a buddy of mine said, Hey Jay, you like selling shit, right? I said, 
yeah, I like selling shit. I mean, it wasn't, I sold pretty much everything else except drugs. Um, <laughs> I'm like, he's like, you like, you like cars too, right? I was like, yeah, shit. I like cars. He's like, well, why don't you come sell cars with me? Little did I know this guy got a $500 referral check. If I came and worked at the dealership. Um, <laughs> so I was like, all right, whatever. I'll try. You know, I needed to make some money when I was in university. So I was like, okay. So I went to go sell cars and instantaneously I found out real fast that I had, I had a true, it was my true calling. I was very, very, very good at it really quick and um, just had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. I, I love the, I love the car business in that sense. You can jump in. Uh, when we, when I, I lost my granite business, I came from doing the granite industry. And at that point I was battling investors that were actually in Ontario, battling accountants and all this. And, and at the time we had to, we had to deal with insurance because there's a fire and arson and a bunch of stuff. So what happened was I was sitting back, kind of looking at opening again while everyone else was trying to make sure that didn't happen. My investors are like, we had a five-year plan. It's year three. I'm going to take myself out because we'll never profit. When we sell. But I'm like, oh, well, that makes sense. So I'm still like, oh, I'm still going to open again. <laughs> and then it got to the point where it became very apparent I wasn't going to open again without selling my soul. And so I, instead of selling my soul back into the grand industry, I sold my soul and got into the car business. And <laughs> that was... You just sold I, your soul to somebody else. That's all you yeah, did, man. That's all it was, right? And I still like, haven't got it back, I'm pretty sure. But <laughs> this, we, I, call, I call the automotive industry the island of misfit toys. Uh, once you're on the island, you're on the island. Like, uh, you might leave for a little bit, but it's in your blood. You'll never get it out. <laughs> it, it's hard. It gets in you. Like, um, the, the auto industry for me was, I, I was like, like, why are you going to that route? I'm like, where can I make good money right now to support my family? Yeah. and jump in and, and sales was my background yeah. where where can strength. you be a total delinquent and make six figures a year oh it's, it's true. <laughs> legally it's true. legally it's true. be a delinquent and, the, and make six figures a year <laughs> it, it's true these guys uh, they'll come in and, and you know what they know where they're comfortable at and they'll come in and they won't sell anything for two weeks and then all of a sudden they'll boom three days they'll pull out 15 cars and they'll be like all right and then they go back into hibernation until next oh yeah yeah it's like the most frustrating dudes for a business owner um because they could just light that whole business on fire um but they just they know their comfort zone and what they need to create to support their habits and, that's uh, true <laughs> that's true hey look, money was good money was real good so you know I, I i sold cars had a lot of fun doing that i mean obviously i quickly gained you know r rose up through the ropes um and uh i became a floor manager a floor manager turned into a sales manager um and then i did something kind of silly because at at that point in time, I decided I wanted to own my own dealership. And I was like, you know what though, but if I need, if I'm going to do that, I'm going to have to learn every aspect of the business. So I actually left a very, very lucrative sales manager position and actually went and became a service advisor. And I did that for a little while. And then I said, you know what? Okay, this was good. I spent about three or four months as being a service advisor. I'm like, okay, I get the gist of this. And then I went and spent another nine months in the uh, admin office. It's just literally, I was the admin's bitch. The admin's bitch. I was just whatever the controller needed. That's just what I did. I was just, I no no questions asked. Whatever she needed, I did it. And so I learned that side of the business. And then I spent some time in the parts department. So I literally, I I, I took monster pay decreases to go work every single aspect of the business so that when the opportunity arose, I could go do that. Now, marketing was always my background. So I, it was no surprise that, you know, when my dealership, you know, decided that they wanted to create a internet department, um, they were like, okay, so who's the youngest person we have that actually understands something to do with digital? <laughs> it was like, well, there's Jason. <laughs> and this was he, after yeah. they went to the dealer principal's niece who's in university. Pretty much. Got yeah, this was 2000. <laughs> To, uh, gosh, what was it? 2007, six, six, nice. you know, and it was like, yeah, he knows about this digital crap. Sure. He can go do this. And so it's like, okay, cool. So they're like, Hey, look, we're, we're, there was at the time I was working for a group that had about seven dealerships across the Southwest. And, uh, they're like, we're going to do this thing called a BDC. And I was like, okay, mm -hmm. made a call center. And they're like, yeah, yeah. Oh, you know about this stuff. I'm like, yeah, I know about this stuff. <laughs> They're like, can you create a presentation for us next week? We're hiring for a head of operations for that department. We think you'd be great for it. And I was like, absolutely, no problem. I had no idea what the hell he was talking about. 
Yeah. So I, I literally for about four days straight, I just stayed up. I was, uh, uh, I was on Red Bull and Mountain Dew and uh, I created this presentation and I was just like, here it is. This is what I'm going to do. You know, we're going to sell, we're going to sell cars remotely across the nation. You know, I'm going to handle all the digital marketing, you know, so on and so forth. Right. And they're like, okay. <laughs> and sure enough, I did this presentation. I didn't think anything was going to happen at the end of the presentation. The owner at the very end of the board table goes, yeah, all right. I was like, all right, to what? You're like, I haven't slept in four days. Give me more. <laughs> what, what did I just do? And then that that really catapulted my my career into the internet operation side and digital marketing and uh, BDC. And then I moved to Canada about uh, 10 years ago. So during the recession, the dealer group I worked for went belly up, uh, like most GM dealerships at that time. And uh, I thought I'd do something crazy. I'd move to Canada. I was like, yeah, I just find myself another big dealer group to work with. No big deal. Oh, crap. Was I surprised when I got to Canada? And it was like, you know, I had personally delivered and sold mo more cars than most dealerships I sat down to talk to like collectively. Mm. <laughs> like, you know, my best year was 562 units. And it was nice. like, I was like, whoa, what's going on? I literally thought Ashton Kircher was going to jump out of a closet and say, you're punked. Got yeah. you, you know. It's, and it's a little different here. Toronto. It was, it was a mean, little different. Just Toronto's just better than here, but yeah. But uh, so it was, we're, we're in Nova Scotia, and it's like the dealership. First time I went to a dealership, and I'm trying to figure out the math and how many people are on the floor, and I'm like, this just doesn't are add starving. up. I'm <laughs> like, this doesn't, this doesn't make, the math doesn't make sense to me. So I, I started to consult with dealerships all over, um, all over Ontario and Canada. Uh, eventually, uh, took a. Uh, a what did they call me? VP of digital marketing for the Zinc and Automotive Group. So I worked for them. Uh, amazing group, but really at the end of the day, they were a group of dealers, not necessarily a dealer group, right? But the owner's mm -hmm. amazing. Joe Zinc is an amazing character. Mm -hmm. And uh, so I, I, at that point in time, I, I did something crazy. I was like, I'm going to go start my own dealership. And uh, I had a partner at the time. I told him my idea and I thought I was going to do it in five years. And uh, he's like, well, why don't we do it next month? I'm like, <laughs> Okay. <laughs> So, so literally within the time I said I was going to do it, it was six months and we took over our first Mitsubishi dealership and it was Cambridge Mitsubishi. We had a blast doing it. It was a lot of fun. Look, it was a used car dealership with a flag out front, you know, but operationally it allowed me to test and play with ideas and processes that I'd never been able to play with and try out before. It was a lot of fun. Within about three months of taking over that dealership, Mitsubishi came to us and said, would you be interested in doing Hamilton Mitsubishi as well? I'm like, no, you know, and they're like, well, make us an offer. I'm like, okay, fine. I don't want to be rude. So I, I came up with the most ridiculous demands in the world. Sure enough, we sent over the demands and their response was, okay, crap. Uh, just took over. To it. Yeah. That just took over. Like literally I'm, 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 I'm just getting into the into that side of the business, uh, uh, entrepreneur, uh, startup, like, you know, working 14, 15 hours a day. And all of a sudden now I'm taking over second location. So that was fun. The heyday with Mitsubishi was just like, <laughs> really trying oh, to get market share. Yeah, we, but we had a lot of fun. Like it was, it was fun. We were scrappy. We were small. We were raw. We were, we were you know, we were aggressive. Um, that was a lot of fun. I, I did that for a few years and uh, <laughs> had a few kids and, uh, you know, deal of life ain't easy, man, having kids. So I had to make a call. I got three kids under the age of nine right now. Back then they were a lot younger. <laughs> and um, I remember, you know, my second, my second son, I don't even remember the first year and a half of his life. I was at the dealerships the entire time. So I was yeah. like, Some, something's got to change. A third son came around and I was like, something's got to change. This isn't going to work. And I, uh, yeah, I decided to let the dealerships go and I started the agency and that is where we come to today. So we've been running nice. an agency now for the last four years, four and a half years. Um, and I've uh, been making content and just having a blast. <laughs> that's awesome. Well, that's a, you raise a perfect point. The, the car business is not, there's tons of people that have good families inside of the car business, but uh, as a dealer principal oh. or and all that, I was like, man, what am I striving to be here? Like, and I'm looking at my leaders in any capacity and I'm like, not one of them have the setup I want. They might have the bank account I want. And then even most cases, it was just on paper. There was no cash. And, and I was like, man, like, kids are going to hate and that really scared me and that put into that put things into perspective and that started my exit plan um but simultaneously i still had this like well if i ever do this again i'm going to own it myself and do it my way right like just that was the that was the whole time 
but as far as the agency goes, you started four or five years ago, but you were yep. in business uh, 2012, 2014. So you yeah, were around, that's when the consulting side of it started kicking in. You know, were and you around just, for the heyday of marketing leads and lead generation online? Oh, God. Like, yeah. Put it in, was so good. Put, put an e-price button on your website and I'll increase your leads by 40%. Yeah, that crap. Yeah, I remember that. <laughs> well, generating quality leads work for like, the, the non-prime industry. Especially, no, no, oh man, it was great until we actually, I mean, we screwed it up as an industry. We screwed it's, it up, right? We, 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 we promised, we promised, you know, customers like fill out this lead and you'll get this. And we never actually gave it to them. That's a problem. So, you know, it's like lead count has been down year over year over year. And it makes sense because why the hell would someone actually want to fill out a lead? Well, not even only that. They're coming into these situations. This is what bugged me. It's like, and people that I work for always love making money and they love to get people to, to, to do things. And I would be like, no, I'm not doing it. Like if we do this to them now, they would, this is what they say. If we do this to them, if we don't do this to them, someone else will. And I was like, it's not a one and done scenario. This is what really made me hate the business is I, I'm, at that time, I'm, I'm 28. I'm 29, 30. I don't know how old I was. 30. I was, I was in my 30. It was seven years, six, five years ago when I first got in the car. And so I'm, I'm like, I'm in my 30s. I have a long life in the car business of having these people come back. I can't just write them off now. So then I got out of the car business, but then I started serving them doing lead gen. And what happened was the, leads, the lead quality has gone way down. Yep. Price to, to acquire them has gone way up. Conversion is like just out of the window and everyone's getting upset about it. And you start raising the quality and they start hitting some home runs. And but they're like, wow, but it's really hard because we have to bury $15,000. And I'm like, you oh. bury $15,000 because of what you did before. <laughs> yep. like, you pull people out of cars that shouldn't have been pulled out of cars. And they're, you know, they're just doing that's what happens problems. when you have 84 months, 0% financing. It's just I remember, I remember when um, 60 month financing came out in the automotive industry and it was a big freaking deal. It was like, hold on. Holy crap. You can do 60 month financing. Like that was a big deal. Yeah. You know? well, there was no non-prime. But <laughs> yeah, exactly. Like it was like, that's that, that, that was something. Right. But, you know, I think from the lead perspective, the reason why the people don't feel that, the, all the, what was that? Sorry, my thing glitched out, so I thought it was dead air. Um, my the reason it started to come out now with non prime and, and stuff is because the banks wanted a piece of that action, so the banks are getting sure. away from that prime and they don't even want that business anymore. Prime banks do not want the prime bank money because they're like, Why are all of our buddies that are lesser than us making more than us, <laughs> yep. right? And everyone just started gearing away, and then you're just you're rewarding the dealers. And then this whole online platform is a big race. And you got your V autos and all that stuff, just racing your front line. Oh, inventory. you mean the, the race to the bottom? Racing. Yeah. And, yeah, don't and get so, me started about that. Oh, well, that's that's why you're here. <laughs> that's <laughs> like the race is zero. I got some four letter words to describe you're starting the race to the bottom. And trying to just jam it in the back end. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. It's a, it's, a, it's a vicious industry. And how are you? pivoting now um before sorry no let's not even say now how have you pivoted in the last year because it's changed a lot in the last year compared to what it was 2017 sure how have you well, pivoted to to gain relevance and make sure that your systems are working for your customer so for our dealerships is that what you're asking yeah 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 you know what it is is the, the expectation of a customer is not just to meet the expectation. We actually have to exceed the expectation. So, you know, just to be able to actually sell somebody a car or service their car, that is simply just meeting the expectation. But that is not the customer's expectation anymore. And it's not our fault. If we didn't do that as an industry. Every other industry did that. Amazon did that for us. Netflix did that for us, right? You know, they exceeded the customer's expectations. So what we do is we spend a lot of times with, with our clients figuring out that portion. Like, my clients are fine. They can meet the customer's expectations, at least meet the meet the bare bones expectation. Like you sign paperwork, I give you car. Okay, mm -hmm. there we go. I met, you know, there's a transaction that's happened, right? You know, you need oil change, give me your money. There we go. You know what it is, but it's just like, how do we exceed that? So we play in that space. 
from a marketing from marketing agency and a content development agency and a branding agency, that's where we figure it out. Like what is what, you know, it's just like, it's not enough just to meet my expectation. What do you do as a business to exceed my expectation? That has a lot to do with the brand. Like, what does it mean to buy a car from ABC Motors? You know, it's like, it's not, it's like I could buy a Toyota from 30 different locations in the GTA. Like it's stupid, right? But what does it mean to buy a Toyota from your dealership? You know, how does, how does me being a part of your community go above and beyond just the transaction? Yeah. So that's where we, that's where we've, that's where we've found our sweet spot. We find that, that, that area right there of how we exceed the customer's expectation is where we shine as far as an agency goes. Which I think is amazing because there's so many people working uh, dealer management and used car manager and sales manager and all that. They're, every day someone's coming in saying they were going to do something. Not often were they coming in saying, okay, we have an actual plan to take you from here to here, like to exactly. exceed the expectations. And and then there's a auto industry has a lot of ego in it. It's a big ego. Whoa, whoa, whoa. And so what? that's a, we, we, there's ego in the industry. <laughs> Come on, Greg. <laughs> it's it's huge. Like that's a that's a top wall to break down when you walk into a dealership and be like, "Hey, you guys aren't actually exceeding." And I know you believe you are, but like, how do you start that conversation with them without alging too much of your tactics? But like, I call I call it full belly syndrome. Yeah, I literally go in and say, "You got a full belly right now. All you talk about is what you have done. You have not yet talked about what you could have done." And yeah. so I call it full belly. So I'm writing that down just because I like it. And I'm probably going to <laughs> well, that's, page. that's what it is. And so, so it's my way of saying you're doing it wrong. You know, it's like, it's, it, instead of me coming out and saying, you're just fucking this all up. Like right now, what I see as far as your operations go and your marketing efforts and every dollar that you're spending on your P and L is that literally it's just showing me that you're full. You're mm -hmm. satisfied with mediocrity. So like, like that sales guy that only turns it on for three days a month. Yeah, exactly. And then, <laughs> but you know what? That's okay though. They can stay in that space and operate and still make a profit. And that's okay. Like, I don't even have a beef with that. But if can they, they? But can no, they? No, they, they, they can. Well, maybe not now. Decline. They but they I mean, have they, been able to, right? So that's mm. actually, that's actually, you know, that's a good segue into another conversation we could have. But it's like <laughs> in the past, they have been able to get away with that. Look, you could half ass your way through operations, half ass your way through marketing, and you could still make a dollar. Yeah. Well, did you, did you find that dealers, um, have lost the community while trying to go online. Well, like they never had like, a community. Like they do, like, like if you ever seen a dealerships or majority, I'm not, there's some out there that are crushing it. So I'm not going to talk about all of them. Right. But let's just say a good majority of dealership social media efforts. There ain't nothing social about their social media efforts. <laughs> right. <laughs> They understood, they understood the media concept, right? <laughs> Let's take pictures of every single freaking customer we sell a car to, and they're smiling and thumbs up. Well, the biggest but we, thing, but we is... won't actually be social in our efforts. We won't engage with people. We won't engage with our with our with our community. We won't perceive them as a community. We we perceive our database of VIN numbers to serve us and our bottom line, not necessarily the other way around. Where we need to serve them and them as a community. If they if they haven't chosen to do business with us, we wouldn't exist. Total different mm -hmm. mind shift. Well, I, I feel like I feel like the the need to have trackable analytics and see what's happening. That desire became so strong with the internet and going online and doing Facebook marketing and all that that so many people were selling. Don't worry about this because you can't. How many does that sell you? How many cars does that sell you? How many customers does that bring? And this relevant to any industry. How many uh, customers does that bring into your door? And that doesn't bring anything. Buy my product, go online, do this, and you're going to sell cars. And I'll be able to tell you how many people came to your page, how many people left, how many people did that. And then what happened is what I mean by left the community, the same community that built these dealers, the parades, the sponsoring the hockey teams, the, all that stuff starts with that budget. You know, I'll just say smaller that, and like, smaller. That's, that's, that's crap. Like I'm going to make something real clear for all the people out there listening. If any dealerships are listening, if you think you, you think you're a part of your community because you sponsor a handful of hockey teams, you're fucking wrong. Yeah. Like it's just, that's just bottom line. That's not being a part of your community. You need to be yeah. in your community. All right. I think they, that's what built them before the internet. Well, before hundred percent, you were actively involved. 
You know, just because you just because you wrote a check to some minor league hockey team does not mean you're a part of the bloody community. Just because you paid to throw a couple trucks down at the local rib fest doesn't mean you're a freaking part of the community. Like, be an actual part of the community. You know, that means you actually have to produce. You actually have to engage. You right? Have to be there. Yeah, you have to be there. You know, you actually have to be a human being. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and, and that's a, that's a that's a big thing. I found people that really won at that in our marketplace um are tra- like they're transferring that world where they actually do go out and be in the community sure. they're putting that all online and it's killing it for them like they're making a killing um because it's actually real instead of just saying they're doing something whatever they're showing it and then you got the majority of dealers not really showing up online the way they need to be and and I think it's, they're trying to put this persona out there that is worried about the optics. And well, right you know what? Now, that's that's the cool thing with social media and the internet. It exposes you. Very much. Like like it's it's not enough to say that we care about our community. We're number one in CSI. We're number. One. I, you know what? Wouldn't it be funny if someone actually said we're number two? I swear to God, I would love that because who doesn't like a good number two? Anyway. Well, I love when they mention things that like nobody gives <laughs> like, the industry. No one, no one gives like no one gives a crap about that stuff, right? Like it's like you can't say you've been serving the community for forty five years. What the hell does that mean? Yeah. What do you mean? They were police officers, and then they opened the dealership. I think yeah, like like you walk around like with the badge of pride because you sell cars. Like no, that's not how it works. There are some real dealerships out there that have done some phenomenal things and have actually intertwined their business into the community because they fundamentally understand and it's a mental frame of mind that without that community, their business does not exist. Now we're beginning to see that right now. Yeah, right? I think that's what I think that's that's the good transition right now. I think the stuff that's important is really, really coming to the forefront. And instead of saying later, they're being forced to do it now. But also, now everyone's Jake, uh, drinking the Jason strategy tea or coffee, <laughs> the closer coffee. And everyone's doing, we'll get to that after. Um, yeah, everybody needs really, to go get their closers coffee at closerscoffee.com. No, I'm just kidding. <laughs> yes, yes. So go get your coffee, closer coffee. You can't, coffee is for closers and Jason's got the brand for you. Um, that's right now with COVID. It's bringing this out to the forefront. And now they're, they're literally looking at what you're telling them. And, and there's a lot of people that you probably talked to and pitched who might not have aligned with you and you moved on to your other clients that you love serving that are like, man, we might need to get Jason back in here and kind of woo him a bit um, because we got to make some moves. What are dealers doing right now? Um, it's, it's 50, 50. All right. Half of them are sticking their heads in the sand and putting their fingers in their ears and going la, 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 until the shit blows over. And then the other half are looking at this and saying, you know, this is the time in, in moments like this is where businesses, brands can really be, you know, broken or, you know, lifted. And so it's like, I, I think, I think for the dealerships out there that are looking, at, I hate to say this is an opportunity because this is a horrible time. Like there's, there's bad shit happening. Right. Oh, but it you is. know, but th- there is, there, there, there is some plus, right. People sleep and just like you said, yeah. exactly. You know, I had a dealer I was talking to the other day who had to lay off 75% of his staff. And he's like, man, what are you doing? He's like, look, I'm, I, I decided that I'm going to let them keep their demos. And I'm encouraging them to, you know, uh, uh, use the demos for Uber Eats. So, like, it's just that's one thing he can do. It's a little thing, and it, you know, it, there's probably it's pretty huge though. But I, when I he, he's cool literally problem. coming out and say, "Look, I, I know you're in a bad spot. You know, um, you know, I know there's some. Look, the government's doing a great job right now. I think, you know, but still, you need to make it a few extra bucks. Take the demo, keep the demo. All right, and." You know, if you can make a few extra dollars doing some Uber Eats, man, do it. You know, I'm, I'm, I'm for it. I'm okay with that, right? So th- there's stuff like that, right? There was another dealership I had heard that he actually donated his, his don't his uh, demos to uh, hospital and first responders, so that they didn't have to use the family car to come back and forth. They can actually stay in a different vehicle, so that that vehicle was contaminated in in, in one vehicle. So it wasn't they didn't have to cross-contaminate multiple vehicles to just get from work to work to home. Like dude, there's, there's opportunities out there to show how you can really be like, you actually really care about, you know, the community, but you're only going to be able to do that because you actually care. You're not going to do it because you just want to do it. And you think it's a good idea for optics. Like, oh, I might sell cars, but no, like 
there, there's a, a whole set of risk and exposure there that is uh, that you're putting yourself out for. So you have to care to else's driveway all the time. Um, that's how that brings me another thing. The RV dealers are going to have a, a really, really bad season um, because of this. Because RV dealers? No, like uh, like RVs and, and... You know what's funny? My sister was actually on the news the other day. Now, she lives in New Mexico. All right. But she was on the news the other day. And uh, she is a, um, a pediatric nurse. And uh, there is a facebook page i believe it's called rvs for mds and uh people with rvs are donating them to be used to people you know first responders and hospital workers uh so that they can quarantine themselves off from their from their families nice. so my my sister is moving into an rv this week uh so that she can stay away from her fiance and her son um you know so that she can continue to do what is required of her as a job. So look, look, dude, there's a lot of opportunities. I haven't heard of an RV dealer doing that. I mean, look, it's sitting there. It is sitting there. You know, the inventory is there. I mean, I'm not, I don't know. Maybe we've got an RV listener, you know, RV dealer listening yeah. to this. Now go uh, Jerry's there. RV. You're local to me. Listen, <laughs> Pine Acres, all of you guys, you guys should be hooking doctors and nurses up with some RVs and you heard it here from Jason. I know it's an opportunity to write, but look, dude, the only reason you're going to do this, not because we said so and it's a good idea. It's because here it makes sense for you to do it. Mm-hmm. You know, you feel convicted to do it. Like don't, don't think of it as a campaign. I had someone actually, a client of mine who I give him a hard time for reach out to me. He goes, Hey Jason, what's a good community campaign I can run. I'm like, are you kidding me? Uh, <laughs> what do you think a good community campaign should be? Like, Listen, he was looking to me to come up with something that would be relevant for his community. Which, <laughs> and, which is great that he knew you could come up with something like that, but something like that is like something that comes to you after a good meditation by a river. Like, uh, like it's, it's, it's taking a moment to look yourself in the mirror, right? No, 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 no. To this guy's point, he did. And he was just struggling. He, he did actually take that moment to say, look, no, I do need to do something. I do need to give back. But, you know, I, I took the call and I was like, well, is this for optics or is this for, is this because you feel convicted you need to do something and so it was cool that he did say i am convicted i want to do something you know so um we put together a um a coloring competition for him and you can go to the dealership's website right now and download it's a daily coloring competition and you can download the pdf and print it out and your kids can enter and every day they're giving away a hundred dollar amazon gift card and uh you just hashtag the dealership and you know it's like like I, I know for a lot of people maybe listening to this code, that doesn't sound like fun. Well, I got three kids at home. Yeah. Okay. I'm going to tell you right now that, you know, a coloring competition for a chance that they can win a hundred dollar Amazon gift card, which to them is like a billion dollars. Right. Oh, 25 bucks goes a long way. Like, like they're like a hundred bucks. What? Like 35 get, pop sockets. Like how many Beyblades can I get? <laughs> Yeah, you know, but I think it's great. You know, it's like the communities get involved in it. They're hashtagging the dealership. There, and people are entering into the coloring competition. And like, he's giving something a little bit back. He's giving some form of, of entertainment and uh, having a little fun at it, right? So I think it's a good idea. What do you What do you think? Are you starting the strategy of reopening now? As people are people already thinking about that without having all the information? Or well, is everyone- it, it depends where you are in what province and what part of the country you're in, right? So the, there's three different levels kind of right now. There are dealerships that are completely closed, all right? And there's just no business at all, all right? Mm-hmm. There are dealerships that are operating and usually operating with limited staff and limited, you know, limited hours. And then there are dealerships that are operating uh, by uh, appointment only, mm-hmm. you know? So, so it just kind of depends on the dealership. I think right now is what it is key is that from a dealership's perspective, they need to figure out what to communicate. And I know it sounds crazy, but the first thing they need to communicate is the fact that they're freaking open or not. You know, you'd be amazed how many dealerships websites I've gone to right now where the website doesn't look like it any different than it did uh, three months ago. You know, mm. but everything's different, right? So, you know, it's not, I shouldn't have Susie to, in the internet department was laid off first. Probably. Um, <laughs> you know, it's like, it's not three slides deep. I should find out that, oh, hey, we're open. You know, here's what you should do. It should be the, literally the first thing I see when I hit your website. You know, we're open, we're not open, and we're open by appointment, you know? 
And so, so the other, like the customer wants to know that they're open. Here's the kicker. It's, it's not just your website. A lot of dealerships are seem to forget about their Google, my business page, their Facebook page where Facebook live right now, you can be amazed how many dealerships have not updated their Facebook business page with their new operating hours or they're not open, you know? So it's like actually just communicating the fact that you're open or you're not open. And the second thing they need to communicate is what the hell is the process? If I have to service my car right now, what are the one through seven steps I'm going to need to take to service my vehicle with you? Like, I don't know what they are. Like, do I do I do I drive up and just you know throw the keys at the door? Honk the horn, really? Just honk the yeah, horn. Do I like that's what I'm saying? Like, do I do it? Like, how do I do it? So it's communicating the process, and same thing with sales, right? Um, you know, if I have to buy a car right now, if I have to, I don't think a lot of people will be, but if I have to, what, what's the process? How the hell do I do it? You know, so the process needs to be communicated. That's the second message. The third message, then if you want to, you can introduce an offer, but be careful with that. Your offer, your offer needs to come from a place of empathy. Yeah. You know, well, focus on the service right now more than anything, I believe. Um, I would definitely focus on making sure that they're paying a little bit less or offering some sort of payment plan or credit services to it, help it could them be get that. stuff done now. Right? Right? Yeah, it's, it's say like, you know what? service now pay later i don't know maybe some of these dealers can afford to self-finance a lot of this mm -hmm. because it's a cost some can some can't i mean i'll tell you right now you know being the owner of a dealership you'd be amazed how cash hungry these monsters are there's no um, there's a, it's surprisingly bad yeah i mean it's a lot so you know but but yeah i mean look i think there's something that you know it's the same there's an offer can be made out there. I have a dealership right now that's not offering a discount, but what they are offering is a $39.99 disinfectant uh, detail package. So it's like a real proper one, not just like I'm going to take a couple of Lysol wipes and just wipe your seats down. Like an actual real popper using chemicals with steam, going through every inch and crevice of the car and properly sterilizing it. You know, so it's like the, there, there are things out there that definitely do have value. I mean, look, I even myself, my Maxima sent right outside the window I'm looking at and, you know, it's still got snow tires on it. I know over the next month or so, I'm going to have to go get those snow tires swapped. And I'm hoping that when I go to my dealership's website and I click on the website, I'm going to find out that they're open and what their operating hours are. And then I'm going to be immediately told what is the process because I have no bloody clue what the process is. It's a uh, one, it's probably hard to pick the dealer that you go to with serving dealers. Um, I, I don't know how you pick that, but it's probably opens up a lot of conversation for you. And that's what I want to get into is, is what are you doing to move the needle forward? What is Jason doing to move the needle forward right now when it feels like everything's going? Well, look, I mean, a lot of my dealerships are no longer, you know, they don't have huge marketing budgets. That makes sense. I mean, I got no beef with that, right? We're spending a lot of our time right now helping dealerships develop out those processes that I just talked about. You know, nice. that, that's so a lot of the time we're spending is in consulting, in operations and going, right, if you are open for service, what are the one through seven, one through 10 steps that are required to actually be able to service with you? And then it's like, once we have those documented, how do we present those? So what is the creative requirement? You know, if you're going to put an ad out there, which I think it's okay to put some ads out there, you know, because I think customers do want to see the fact that somebody is open. You know, When this first happened, it was everyone just started, it was like everyone started putting ads out there at the very start because they felt like they needed to be online because all of a sudden they were off like line in real life and and they all of a sudden it's all these ads like crazy coming out and then all i thought was like man COVID 19 hit and every car dealer's are they're like we have cars all right like and i'm like where did they come from well, they weren't doing this before and then they seem to pedal off because they realize this might not be the time to be trying to sell no i look the, the, the time right now is to be available if somebody needs you Okay. And how are you going to be available for that? And then secondly, you know, the time right now is to uh, look inwards and towards your community of customers that allow you to actually be a business and is what, what can you do? What can you say? What can you create? Right. That is relevant, right. To that, to that database. Like how can you support them? It, it maybe it's something as simple as just a coloring competition, which takes up 15 to 25 minutes of my kid's time to be able to print it out and just, go to town on it. And I get that 15 to 20 minutes of quietness because they're focused on a, a, a coloring to get a hundred dollar Amazon card. You know, like yeah. that's just, it's something little, but little things make a huge difference to our customers. 
it's, I was had uh, Jim Stagg on Monday night and he talked about just doing reps, always doing reps. It's just the little things they, that matter and you're focusing on those reps and you're right, that's a little thing. Mm-hmm. But it's actually, I'm sitting here like, man, that was a wicked plan. But I'm a marketing guy. Like, I'm like, that was awesome. And someone's like, well, it's kind of a weird thing to do. But it's impactful because it actually creates a better life for a few minutes inside of that house. Yeah, it's just and a little bit of value. It's just, it's just a, a more so value. Or you laugh or something. It creates a moment that you weren't going to have in the first place. Um, and and your kids are super happy with this achievement. And so not only the people that win the hundred dollar gift card, it's 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 impacting them at some level at a very bad time in a positive way, and that should be memorable. Yeah, hundred percent. I, I think that's super important. That's a I think that's a wonderful plan. Yep. And, I mean, uh, I have I have some other dealerships that are uh, delivering groceries for some of their customers. Yes, we have. You know, I got a, I got a dealership that's doing that. Here they're just you. offering like if you need help. If right now you're at home or whatever, maybe you're an elderly individual or you're a single mom and you got a bunch of kids at home, you just can't get out of the house, man. You need help picking up your groceries because you ordered in, you called in and you ordered it, you know, we'll, we'll, we'll come by, we'll pick them up for you. You know, and the grocery thing's great right now. You just pull up, you show them the name, you show them the confirmation number, they throw the crap in the back, right? You push the button for the tailgate, tailgate goes down, you roll into the customer's house, you open up the tailgate, they unload it. So you're still maintaining perfect social distancing. It's a clean process, but boy, do you look like, I mean, it's just, it's, I don't want, I don't want to say you look like a winner, but it is just, it's just showing that you, man, you care. Yeah. That's, that's huge. There's a dealer here that's doing food for the front line. Oh, and see, there you go. That's a good one too. I love they're that. Taking food to the, all the people on the front line. Yeah. I and they the basically other commissioned everyone that worked at his dealership with their inventory and they're running the road. Yeah. Which I thought was, and they did that within hours. Actually, but I got to talk with that for a second. They were doing that within, I'd say 48 hours. They had it live online. Ah, and that's because they're revenue. convicted. Yeah, it that, was instant. That was, it was like, we're not selling cars anymore. Insane. Boom, shot it off. There you go. Yep. Yeah, and I think that's that, conviction. That goes, yeah, that goes a long way, mm-hmm. for sure. So coming out of this, uh, Jason, the strategy with Jason, we're hitting forty pieces of content a day, which is huge. I, I watch a lot of the stuff that you put out. Um, your with everything you see going on right now. Yep. And you're making your own personal predictions based on a lot of false truths and a lot of real truths, whatever's out there. <laughs> and then, you know, your buddy sends you a conspiracy theory or two. And oh, then, love those. And then, and so then you go on to like that rabbit hole and you're like, man, like, is money going to be worth anything at the end of this? Are they just promising us all this money because they know it's going to have no value? What is that going to do with my business? Nice. Are, you, are you thinking that at all? Like, are you worried? Or just, um, you know what? I, I always have a plan A, B, and C, and D. You know, it's the, I guess it's the Boy Scout in me growing up. It was like just always be prepared. So it's uh, I I'm not uh, I'm not overly worried. I don't feel super anxious. You know, yeah. because I just uh, I you know what it is. It, I'll tell you where that comes from. That doesn't come from cockiness. It comes from self self awareness. Mm-hmm. I'm just very self aware of who I am as an individual, what my capabilities are to execute. And I know regardless of what happens to the economy and what it looks like in, you know, six, nine, 12, 18 months is that there will always be a place for me to, you know, continue to execute at a high level. <laughs> that's good. Yeah. Well, that, I think that's important to, to have that personal conviction that you're just, you know, that it's going to be all right. There's a, there's a part of me that's like, you know what? I think I've been asking you for nothing for so long and maybe I'm getting my wish so I can't be upset about this. This is my fault. Yeah. So <laughs> um, I, I think that's the ability to pivot. Doing this, the summit, um, having a bunch of speakers come on this week was just, I, I wanted to do something to change the narrative. I wanted to bring some value. There's, I saw a lot of upset people on my Facebook. Sure. And I wanted to say, okay, listen, these guys are killing it in the middle of uh, a pandemic. Um, they're making moves and it's for you to keep that mindset well you, you and, know how you do that is you do that through routine well what you, that's what that's you where has moved that's where like moving. you see you where see you that I, i'm routine. not i'm not i'm not wearing you know and, and i got no beef with right sweatpants and you know t-shirts right I have no but, pants on right like, now like no, i'm just kidding well i probably all right fine i don't um but no you know it's <laughs> like i'm 
I'm, I'm mentally and physically prepared. You know, I, I, I get up at the same time I've always gotten up. All right. I get dressed the way I've always gotten dressed. I make my bed the way I've always made my bed. You know, like I'm nothing for me. This is, I'm keeping myself into a very clean, super tight routine. In fact, actually, I probably find that I'm even busier now more than ever, you know, because people are definitely answering phones and wanting to communicate and have conversations. Oh, well, yeah, I'm busier you know? than, than I ever been. I'm well, this is my fourth podcast. Though. This is my fourth podcast today. <laughs> really? Really? That's amazing. So well, that's, it's, it's cool that we were aligned enough in our mindset that you knew that I was going to talk to you about routine. Take us through as a content creator, as a server of your industry, what is a typical day? Like and I ask pretty much everybody this, what is a typical day? A typical day is, well, it's a little different now than it used to be, but I, I usually, I, I used to normally record about anywhere between five to six hours of my day. And um, I, I have a couple of people that travel with me and uh, capture a lot of content. Um, I have a, a driver that drives me so that I'm able to continue to work while I'm on the road. Um, you know, so I, 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 it's literally being productive, not busy. That's the difference. That is the big, big difference, by the way, between uber successful people. And, and I, I feel like I'm, a, a, I'm still an amateur at this and I'm learning at it, right? Is that, you know, a big goal of mine was not to be busy, but to be productive. And that's a huge difference, right? It's easy to be busy. You can move shit around your desk for an hour and all of a sudden be busy, right? But to actually take an hour and be truly productive, well, that's a totally different mindset. So, you know, for, for me, it's just about being productive. You know, right now, what does my routine look like? It's, 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 it's not far off. I mean, again, I probably recorded about yeah, four or five hours of my day today <laughs> between podcasts and webinars. So yeah, a lot of my time is just sent here talking to individuals like yourself, you know, and trying to bring some value, you know, in the form of content. I got, I got, I'm not ever going to pretend like I know everything, but you know, if someone during this last hour that we've chatted can get one thing and they're able to execute it into their daily efforts, man, that, that, that means more to me than any dollar amount I could ever get. So do you serve markets outside of the Toronto GTA area? I do. Um, you know, not a lot, but I do. Um, you know, we're very selective as far as kind of who we work with. You know, we're a boutique agency. We work around 80, 85 dealerships. And, um, you know, it's so it's we, we have a profile. You know, um, we're not your typical agency when it comes to marketing. It's, you know, we we require a lot of the dealerships uh, time and effort to put into it. This is not a put, this is not an easy button. We're not an easy button, right? It's just like, tough. I, I've been in this world where you're just like, you know what? This is going to require your commitment yes. and actual work. And, and not, they, a lot of, not a lot of dealerships are, are willing to do that. And I'm okay with that. Like, I got no problem. Someone just wants to hit the easy button, cut a check. That's cool with me, but that's not how we do. You know, it's just, we require the dealership to be a content developer as well. They have a message. I need to execute on that message and put it out there for the world to consume. So yeah, we stay busy. Nice. We just keep moving sure forward. Man. You get into like hiring for them. What's that? You know, I've been asked a few times. Um, I mean, I, I get a lot of phone calls. <laughs> I get a lot of phone calls. Everyone knows I travel a lot and I know a lot of dealers. So it's like, they'll call me up, go, Jason, I'm just not happy. Do you know somebody? I'm like, hmm. I may say, I may know somebody. I call it matchmaking, not necessarily hiring, but yes, I do do some matchmaking, matchmaking from time to time. You no, know, that's, that's good. That's a, it's, I find that's a big struggle whenever you're going into dealers, uh, new dealers and you look, you do an audit of their systems and processes and you're like, oh. you just, have you ever just ran out the door? Um, I've shook my head or a lot. Or do you feel like you, you should know? fix it? Well, you know what though? I'll just simply have that conversation. Are they, are they satisfied? Like I don't ever want to work with a dealership that's satisfied. If they're satisfied, I'm cool with that. Be satisfied. I got no beef with that. I mean, I'm not, I'm not, you know, no, I'm not the one that's cutting the checks or, you know, printing out the PNLs. If you're satisfied with your business, be satisfied with that. It's cool with me. If you're not satisfied, and you want to push that envelope, I got no problem clearly identifying what the strategies are required to take it to the next level. Um, but an idea is only as good as how well we can execute. Yeah. I can come up with all the best ideas in the world, and the best strategies in the world, but it don't mean shit unless they're actually willing to execute. And then that's where that, where that conversation goes. And it's like, are you actually willing to execute? I have a dirty reputation in this business and it's totally not true. Well, I'll tell you about it. Um, but I, I guess I have a reputation of firing clients. I, um, it's not true. I don't fire clients. 
on a regular basis. Um, but I, I don't have any contracts. I don't, which is really weird, actually, for me being an agency, being I don't have any contracts. Um, I, I find everything to be a very mutual boyfriend-girlfriend type relationship. As long as they keep providing what we need to get our job done, we'll keep providing what they need to do get, to get their job done. But um, if I do break up, I, let's say let's say that. I don't fire clients, but I do break up clients pretty quickly. Um, you know, because it's just not worth our time. I, our team is only going to be able to work with so many clients. So it's very key that we find the right client to work with. And I, that's what I tell my clients is, is they are like, the, some of them are really gung ho and some of them have been through the trenches and the ones that are really gung ho, they don't have any idea of how to say no. And oh, that's a lesson I had to learn very the, early on. That's the power career. that that's you're, you're exhibiting it now, right? So yep. saying no is so important to making sure you make money because there is some time suckers out there. Like yeah. I look, two years ago, I went in and cut most of my clients only because they took up too much of my time during the week. They needed too much hand held, hand holding. They just, they needed too much. And they're like, well, why can't you do this? I'm like, I just literally, I really like to ski and I'm going to start skiing. Like I, I didn't have anything better to say. I just knew that I was like, you're, you're just, you're like a really annoying child. I need to get out of here. <laughs> and, and that was, I just, I wanted to be more online and a little bit less offline with them. I think maybe yep. I didn't, I didn't want to sit in front of them all day and watch them work why they so they felt confident that i was there well I've, I've gone through a few rounds like that when we first started the business i mean our monthly retainer fee has you know significantly grown over the last four you know four and a half years um you know and i've had to have those tough conversations with dealers is that you know i understand that this is the amount of time you need from me and i'm okay with that bottom line is that time is costing more and more every single day so it's like my my, my retainer has to continue to go up and um, you know that doesn't necessarily work for some people and that's okay but you just have to be you have to be very willing to say no and just move on and know that there are just a lot of opportunities out there I think that's important for anyone that's watching this that uh, is in any industry true you might believe by raising your prices that you're pricing yourself Actually, you might be pricing yourself into the best business. So well, I, yeah, it's be 100%. Of that. You, you actually have to do price yourself in the best business because at the end of the day, you want to provide the best service. So the best service requires a price. It requires cost. It has it has a cost associated with it. You know, I mean, I've I've had like I had a conversation this morning where a client wants to put a campaign together, a big video series. All right, but they're only willing to pay so much. I said that's fine. You're going to have to, but my team can execute on this, but. I can't be involved in it. And they're like, what, what do you mean? I said, I can't for that amount of money. And it's okay if that's your budget, it is what it is. I can't be personally involved on the day-to-day execution portion of that, of that project, right? And they were okay with it once I explained it to them, you know? They're like, okay, that's fine. Like they were confident that our, my team could execute it and they can't, I'm confident they can too. <laughs> yeah, which is, a, it's, that's a pretty sweet deal for you too at the same time. Yeah. It frees you up to keep creating it and because you come across as an innovator um, and uh, and a leader, and is going to say a lot about your company by offering that. Say, hey, I'm not going to be able to come. My team's coming out, and they're still moving forward. Because that's a that's a hard thing for a lot of people, especially self-employed people, is yes. to make that shift from business owner to from employee to business owner. Right? Like it's it it's is tough it's tough. To I mean, that. look, they they see they see the forty some odd posts we post every single day. They're like, that's the guy I want to work with. <laughs> and you know, and it's like you can absolutely work with me, but the, the, but the, I can only work with so many. I only have so many hours to work with, right? Mm-hmm. Um, you know, but our, I have a very well trained, I'm very confident in my team's ability. And of course I always have oversight. Like I've never not know what's going on. <laughs> you know, well, they, they know you're going to touch all. it. They, 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 you, they know I'm going to see it. How did you, let's talk about that transition. So, uh, cause I, I want this to serve uh, people in multiple industries and, and I really hope someone, uh, people in the car business are enjoying this. I'm connected to a bunch of them and I'll feed this into a bunch of groups after this. Um, so it will see some eyes in the relative industries, but people outside the industry. How did you make that transition to be so out there and in the faces of the community and be able to still pull in dealers knowing that you weren't going to be the one that's hands-on. How did you make that? Um, you have, you have to let the house burn down. 
Like as, as owners, we instantaneously want to grab a bucket of water and, you know, put out every single fire that happens. And the bottom line is that you're going to have to let some of those fires burn. Uh, so, you know, it's like, I'll watch one of my employees, you know, literally just toast the crap out of a project, like just, just shit, just horribly execute it. But mm. I can easily go in, I can easily throw the water on the fire, and I can be the firefighter, I can save the deal. All right. But at the end of the day, no one learns anything from that. So it was it was a hard lesson. It wasn't an easy lesson, but it was a hard lesson to literally let the house burn. I like, think that's just, that's super important. I, I think the best clients, your clients that will scream from the rooftops about how great you are. Sure. Um, are going to be the ones that had the most problems. When you walk into a place and serve, and this goes for anyone, when you walk into a yep. place and serve and everything goes great, you walk out, it's fine. When I launched my granite company, uh, we caught this kitchen, showed up, went to install it, it broke on the way there. We're like, okay, we'll make a new one. We go back, broke again, go back. Literally, it took us five different times to get this Holy in. It's our God. very first kitchen going in. It wasn't my first time cutting the kitchen. It wasn't anyone's first time cutting the kitchen. But when we first launched this factory, it was the first time for that one. And like the homeowners should be mad. Like should be so mad. And what happened is so many things happened that gave us an opportunity to respond. Yes, that that's the key. Since we responded the way we did, our next three months were jobs that were mostly referrals from him now yeah. our other jobs that we were doing where we went in did our job left left it great and nothing happened nothing bad happened they would everyone's got what they expected um and it was well, that's that's still empowering your team they what happened was those people didn't refer as much as the person that i just destroyed <laughs> like <laughs> it was how we responded so i think that's it's right. how it's how you responded it's how you empowered your team and that's and, burn and, and down. That's, you gotta let the house burn and do you know what um i remember i lost a client over something one of my employees did um they overspent on an account and even though we had system and softwares in place to control ad spend this this one account overspent not by a small amount by about thirteen thousand dollars we'd overspent on their account and um, their accounts are their accounts are credit. They're connected to their credit cards. We don't take, we don't, we don't control people's ad accounts. We just manage their ad accounts. So we were in charge of both ways, but yeah, we've, we've been in charge of managing this person, this, this client's ad account. We overspent by $13,000 and um, I, we lost the account clearly, you know, I owned it. I paid for it. I actually paid the client $13,000. I come into the office and this gentleman was packing up his stuff. He was walking out the door, anticipated that he was being fired. And, and I said, what are you doing? He's like, well, I'm, I'm cleaning up my desk. I'm getting out of here. I said, uh-uh. All right, you're going to sit down and learn what a $13,000 mistake feels like. <laughs> and he owned it. He owned that $13,000 mistake for like a year. Just just told, just told, Every time in a meeting, we something would come up, somebody would say 13K. Um, you know, and it's like he just took it. He just sat there and he owned it. I'll tell you what. How afterwards. bad was his job? Well, it didn't cost us thirteen k. Yeah, it's actually, it's like how bad, you know. And but you know what though? I tell you, the the guy turned out to be one of the best firefighters I ever had. Um, you know, turned out to be a real leader and uh, just really, you know, took the bull by the horn on a lot of projects and really brought a lot, a, way more than what the business actually cost me. I, I definitely. Now. But it was empowering. It was empowering to say that, you know what, I need you to own this mistake instead of running from it. Nice. Is he still working for you now? Uh, he's moved on to actually bigger, better things. <laughs> That's what happens in my industry a lot. You know, you get some really good creative people and it's totally fine, right? You get really good creative people. You kind of help mold them into being better creative people. And then they yeah. find, you know, jobs. You're like, yeah, man, I cannot pay you that. <laughs> yeah. you know? yeah, well, that's the thing. You, you, you polish people and get them prepared for the moment. And that's really your, your service in a nutshell. You're giving back on different levels. Yep. Um, so as long as you're grateful for the time, it's not that bad. It just sucks losing some money people. Yeah. Well, then the key is just constantly empowering, constantly, constantly empowering. That's the key to it all. My, my biggest thing is I always like to have a conversation. Of, okay, so what's your end game? Where do you go from here? You're not going to be doing this in five years because the industry won't exist. You're not like in some cases it won't be right. Like you, some people are riding a wave that's very short lived, and like okay, so what is this leveraging you? 
And some, it blows me away that some people haven't thought about the next thing. Well, you know that this is going to go here, but like pop sockets will go out of business. I don't know why I brought up pop sockets. But, but you know what I mean? Like there's, there's, there's the short waves that you gotta, you gotta run out. Um, sure. What do you feel like for yourself? What do you feel like you're going, you're going to do this? Uh, how are you going to evolve with this market when it comes back? Where do you see the industry? Oh, I think we're going to be totally ready. I mean, during the recession, we had a monster buildup of demand. And when things started to get back to normal, that monster buildup in the automotive industry just went, you know, um, I foresee a huge buildup happening. You know, the, the, there's a lot of people that are in market for a car and have been in market for the last, you know, three months. Guess what? They're still in market. They're just not making a purchase right now. In fact, I actually do believe I was talking earlier on a podcast earlier today. Um, you know, I think there's going to be even more people in market than we anticipated because I think there's going to be a lot of people out there that you know may not choose to take public transit, mm-hmm. may not want to get into that go train or jump Good onto point. that bus. And you know, for that cost, you know, are they just going to spend that little extra money to get that you know Toyota Corolla? So they have themselves and they don't have to share. You know what I mean? Like social distancing is still going to be a thing even after we decide that we're past the worst of this, you know? So I actually think the automotive industry is actually prepped for a big pop. Yeah. I, I never thought of that as how people are going to Swiss going to want to commute. Well, I mean, think, gonna, think, think about it for yourself. You know, let's say June 17th comes by. I, I have no idea. Right. I'm just making up some random date. Well, let's say June 17th comes by the government. We'll put says, on this. Jason Harris predicts. Oh God. I hate when people do that. Cause I'm like, where the hell did you come up with that? But anyways, <laughs> well, let's say hypothetically June 17th comes around and you know, the government's like, yep, we're good. Back to normal. Everyone come out of their you know, caves and go back to what you're doing. Um, are you immediately going to jump back on a bus? Are you immediately going to get into a go train? You know, or are you going to kind of think about that for a moment and go, you know what? I think I'd rather, you know, just transit myself, not with others. <laughs> I think it will spawn. I think it will spawn a lot. I think when some businesses realize that a lot of stuff they can do, you know, that uh, that little ribbon that everyone passes around the sales office that says, I just survived a, a meeting that could have been an email. Yeah, I, exactly. I think that will come into play. I think people sure. will be like, you know what? work from home this week we got this going on i think there's going to be a good drive for that but even those people that aren't really using a vehicle (laughs) for anything are still going to need vehicles because now they're going to have a little bit more of their life back yes and they're ready to get out of the house they're ready to go they're ready to go on road trips they're ready to travel like i actually think our industry is going we're going to get a big pop i really do believe that we're going to get a very sizable you know just burst of opportunities and customers coming into the automotive space I think there's going to be a big where people are going to make their property more personal to them in their houses and such, but they're going to make it more personal to them in their vehicles. Yes. There's a beautiful brand out there right now. And I found them actually it's funny. They're a Canadian company and I was in Florida at Disney and we were camping in Disney and I was walking down to the showers in the morning and I looked and I said, it's a, it's a uh, Subaru Outback. Yep. And it's it done up like roll cages and bumper guards and skid plates and all train tires and a lift kit and i'm like that looks like the funnest car i've ever seen in my life <laughs> so then i'm like i have to ask the guy right and he's 45 47 and he's like he's like actually most of this stuff is from lp adventure and they're they're out of quebec i believe um lp adventure and they they put lift kits in like rav4s and <laughs> everything but i i feel like People are going to travel less, so sure. they're going to invest in the things that they like. So I think no, they, look, they we, we, we saw the exact same thing coming out of the recession. We saw yeah. we saw as things got back to normal, the amount of disposable income and spending and everything just just skyrocketed. You know, over those that first six months. So I anticipate the exact same thing. That's that's good. I, I think they might might take a little bit longer this time. <laughs> possibly but it uh we we weren't affected here in nova scotia and some people were going to come on here and be like no no we totally were but um at the time i was in the granite industry and the people that had money were still spending money and and nova scotia never it's always it never goes really big and it never goes really low so when we feel a little bit decline it's just like a bad day and then we never feel any big increases it's just like a good wednesday right so 
um, we don't feel the stuff that you guys would feel in in, in Ontario. Um, it's the good and bad things about being in a small market. <laughs> but I believe uh, the auto industry is going to be very different coming out. And I think they're going to really push this. I mean, guys like you and me and everyone else have been walking into businesses and telling them to do this for a long time. And now all of a sudden they are willing to there's going to be a lot more open ears for sure. Yeah. And so that's, that should be good. That should be good for you. I'm excited for what you have going on. I love seeing your content. Um, I won't pick up too much more of your time. You've already had a million podcasts you've been on today. And, no, dude, uh, this was, this was a lot of fun. Thanks. Thanks yeah. for having me on. This was a lot of fun. I'd like to have you come back on for a conversation after this, maybe. Um, whenever that is and, absolutely uh, man. or if i want to have a little argument about the industry or if i'm mad about something maybe we should jump let's on. do it <laughs> awesome guys this is a strategy with jason check it out you can uh, find them anywhere i'll put some links uh below but also let's let's pump the coffee again so explain where oh, the, the coffee. coffee came from yeah tell uh, us a little story you know behind the coffee but all right I'll, I'll, uh, so closers coffee uh dot ca I think .com, both of them actually. All right, it is actually uh, it, it's actually connected to our nonprofit. So we run a, a nonprofit. It's called Bell to Bell .ca, and Bell to Bell just kind of came. It's it's a, it's an industry term, right? So you ask someone, "What are you working today?" Somebody would say Bell to Bell, and it's just literally from open to close, right? And uh, Bell to Bell .ca, we have automotive merchandise. So we have t-shirts and hats and mugs and everything that it has interesting and funny sayings that we, we use in our industry. Uh, if you've been in the automotive space, you know that there's a very specific language that gets used in our space. So we had some fun with this. Uh, we actually did make our own coffee. It's actually local. It's cool. It's actually from Windsor, Ontario. And um, there's both a light and a dark. And uh, the coffee came about just from my love of coffee and just starting in the industry. I lived on coffee for the first, you know, five years I was in the business. I was a pot a day, you know, kind of person. That's just what kept the energy going so we can complete a bell to bell. But yeah, check it out. Bell to bell.ca is the URL. All proceeds get uh, donated to the sick kids hospital. So it's, it's just been, it's just a little fun project for us on the side. I'm glad we touched base on that. That's something you should uh, definitely pump. I like that. As a, that's really awesome. A guy I had on about an hour ago, he, his whole thing motto is give more to make more. And, uh, and his, it's all his, all about giving, all about giving. And so, yeah, that's great. But Bell to Bell, I, I mean, the, the language in the car business is funny. Um, it is. Uh, my favorite language. thing is when a dealer tries to use that language in their marketing and I'm like, nobody knows what that means. <laughs> nobody knows what that means. That's right. <laughs> so you've been a blast. Thank you so much. You enjoy. Thanks, your Greg. Evening. This was a lot of fun. And I'll be talking to you soon. Have a good one. Thank you. Thank you.